Well, friends, uh, grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our risen Savior Jesus. Amen. Once again, my name is Dan. I'm, I'm here from Seattle, Washington, over in the U.S., and it's been wonderful this weekend to, to talk about love, uh, to learn with you about love, uh, to share a cup of coffee together, which I very much love. We began yesterday in my first talk describing the different ways we use the word love. The, the world loves, and the love of the world is often focused on loving the things in the world and, and pouring ourselves into the things of the world in order for us to get meaning and significance out of them. But unfortunately, the things of this world die and, and fade away. And they don't offer lasting significance. And the way, the way the world often loves is we love other people in order to get something back. We, we love in a self-interested way. And yet the love of God is a God that, that gives selflessly. God gives his love with out exchanging something. He doesn't need anything in return. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son Jesus as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And it might be tempting when we see that love of God to, to go and, and run out and, and start loving other people, but there's an important step in between. Before we can give this love away, we not only need to see that love, we not only need to know that love, we need to receive it. We need a, a certain perspective and power. We need to see ourselves every single day as recipients, as those who receive God's undeserved grace and love in Jesus. And once we see ourselves as people who receive love, then by the power of the Spirit given to us, then we are able to go and love. And this morning, uh, CERN shared with us about the, the call to action that God has for us. We, you and I, we are the body of Christ, a body that was made to move and fulfill the purpose that God has created us for. It's one thing to want to love. It's one thing to know that we are supposed to love, but it's something entirely different to actually love. And God is calling you and me, my friends, to actually love. First John makes this uh, painfully clear. In, in one, of the, one of the hardest verses in Scripture, I think, First John chapter 4, verse 19, sometimes when I read the Bible, I pretend not to understand it. Do you ever do that? God seems to be saying something that I don't want to hear, and so I pretend not to know what he means. Well, that might be interpreted this way or that way, and we won't do anything until I know. Sometimes when I read the Bible, I pretend not to understand. 1 John chapter 4 doesn't let me do that. It is painfully clear. He says this, we love because he, God, first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. 
For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. It's not optional. He's not saying if you get a good night's sleep and a strong cup of coffee and the people are really nice to you and you have enough time, maybe consider showing a little love. He says, if we have God's love, we love one another. And if we are not loving one another, do you really have God's love? It's like James chapter 2 where James says, show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. If we love God and if we have received the love of God, we love others. That's simply who we are as the people of God. Now, when we love others, we don't, we don't love them to make God love us more. We're, we're not doing it for God. I am not loving my neighbor to make God like me. I don't love my brother to make God love me. I'm not doing it for God, and I'm not even doing it for me. When we love our neighbor, we love them to love them. Martin Luther said it like this. I love this quote. God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. God doesn't need you to be kind to the people around you. That doesn't help God at all. And it doesn't help you at all. It doesn't fulfill God if you are nice and give money. God is God. And it doesn't help you get into heaven if you are nice and give money. Jesus took care of that. God doesn't need your good works. but your neighbor does. God has placed people around you for you to love. God has given you people to love. Not as a burden, not as a chore, not as something you have to do because life is hard and we live in sin and we're paying off our debts. No. God has entrusted you with his children for whom Jesus died so that you would love. Now there's, uh, there's a question. Who do we have to love? Who is my neighbor? That was the question in the Gospel of Luke. You remember when Jesus was speaking with a teacher of the law? They talked about which was the greatest commandment. The first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the man asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And the answer is, well, it's, it's everybody. And that's the true answer, and that's the right answer, but it, it's not a very helpful answer. If I just said, okay, connect, go home, and love everybody, that we wasted a weekend. And it was nice this weekend, in case you didn't notice. Thanks for being here. If I just said, go love everyone, that that's sort of like, do whatever you want, and if you love no one, that's fine too. So what I want to do with the, the little time I have this evening is I want to 
help you think through where God is sending you to love. I want to help you think through the people that God has given to you to love. The people that God, for whom Christ died, has entrusted to you to love. It's going to look different for each of us. I'm going to hop on a plane soon. Some of you are getting on trains. Some of you are going to ride your bicycle back to Copenhagen. <laughs> Do I have my geography right? We're all going in different places. And God has entrusted to each of you different people to love. So I want to give you four different areas of life to consider where God has called you and is calling you to love. And so the, the first one is your family. These are the people that God has immediately given to you, the, the people closest to you. We are to love our family. That looks different for all of us. You might be single, you might be married, you might have kids, you might not. You might live near your parents. Maybe you live in the same house as your parents. Maybe they live in Spain or Italy. It will look different for each of us. But God first and foremost calls us to love in our family. And so you can think through the Ten Commandments, the, the fourth commandment to honor your father and mother. The eighth commandment to, to speak well of your family. As God calls us to love within our families, there are, there are challenges with that. Some of you have very difficult people in your family. Maybe it's hard to love them. Maybe they've made choices that hurt you. Maybe they're continuing to make choices that are unhealthy. The world would say, wait until they've cleaned it up, then love. That's not the love of God. God's love says, love them anyway. And sometimes when you love someone, it hurts. I met my, my brother from Afghanistan earlier today. He came to Denmark from Afghanistan a couple years ago. And he didn't know Jesus when he got here. But now he is a baptized believer in the Lord. And as he tried to love his family, as he sought to share the love of Jesus with his wife, she wanted nothing to do with it. And it hurt. Sometimes as we love the people God gives us to love, it hurts. When Jesus loved the people God the Father gave him to love, it hurt. The love of God is a sacrificial love. So the first place where we love is within our families. Those are the people God has immediately given to you. Another place where God calls us to love is, is where you work. If you're a student, this would be your school. And so tonight you can reflect. Who are the people that God has given you to love in your school or in your workplace? And what would it look like to love them? If you are a, a person who has a job, you can love the customers. You can be kind to them. Don't overcharge them. Uh, show up to work on time. When Martin Luther talked about loving God as a Christian at work, he used the example of somebody who made shoes. And Luther said that a, a Christian shoemaker is not someone who who puts little crosses on all the shoes he makes. A Christian shoemaker 
makes good shoes. Whatever your calling for a, a work is, do that well. You don't have to do it as a Christian. If you're a musician, you don't have to just play Christian music. But I am very thankful for our band this week. You guys are awesome. But if next week you want to play a Mozart concert, go for it. Glorify God with that music. If you want to play some creative European interactive conceptual thing like has been going on in Aarhus this week, great. You don't have to sing about Jesus. Just sing well. We serve God and love our neighbors in our workplace. A third place where we get to love God and where we get to love our neighbor is in our community. Your community might be your neighborhood. What would it look like to love your neighbors? Actually love your neighbors. Not in a, a theological sense, who is my neighbor? Everyone. Everyone. But your actual neighbor, what would that look like? Do you, do you know the name of the person across the street? I don't know. Do Danish people know their neighbors? I have a hard time loving someone I don't know. So maybe a first step could be, hi, my name's Sven. Or whatever your name might be. Do we have any Svens in the room? No. Gosh. I should just get off the stage. Think small. What would it look like to love your actual neighbor? Maybe you, again, I don't know if this is comfortable for Danish people. Maybe you could smile and wave. You can do that. I'm not asking you to mow their lawn or raise their children or pay their taxes. You could just smile. You could smile and you would be a good neighbor. What I'm trying to say is it doesn't have to be that hard. We can start real small. Because a wave might in a couple months turn into a hello and maybe six months later, you could say, hello, my name is whatever a Danish name is. And eventually, you could share life together. This might be your neighborhood. It might be your community. Maybe in the city you live in, there's a real need. Maybe they need volunteers to read to the children. Maybe you see someone on the side of the street and you were going to buy a 20 kroner cup of coffee, but she needs it more. Loving your neighbor sometimes hurts. They might not deserve it. Love doesn't care. The fourth place where we love is, is in our congregations, in our churches. God has given to you his people, his daughters and his sons through baptism that you can love, that you can serve. I don't know what it looks like to serve in a Danish congregation, but I can tell you what it looks like in the States. One of the saddest things in a Christian church in America is the young people who aren't there. And I'm sad for the young people who aren't hearing the gospel, but I'm also sad for the elderly who see the empty row. I'm sad for the grandmas and grandpas who wonder if the faith will be passed on. One of the easiest ways you can love your neighbor at church is show up. If you sit next to that old woman, you will make her day. She might smell funny. Sometimes love hurts. <laughs> the easiest way you can love in your congregation is to sit next to that old man 
he might be singing the wrong stanza. Sometimes love hurts. We love anyway. Maybe your church has been looking for people to teach the children. And every time the pastor stands and looks out, who will volunteer to teach the children? You are on your phone. They're sticky, and they smell funny too. Sometimes love hurts, but love doesn't care. You might have opportunities to do amazing things, to sell all your possessions and to move to Africa and to become a missionary and serve the poor, and that's great. But most of you, God is calling to serve in very small ways. They are small, but they're significant. Paul says it like this in Colossians chapter 3. I have one verse from verse 17 and another one from 23. Paul says this, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul is saying, whatever you do, whether it's something you're saying or something you're doing, do that in the name of the Lord Jesus. When you speak a kind word, you are the body of Christ, Jesus among us speaking words of love. When you smile and wave at your neighbor, you can do that in the name of Jesus. You can be the body of Christ, loving his people in very small but very significant ways every day. In verse 23, Paul says this, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily. I don't know what it says in, in Danish, but in English it's perfect with heart work. He says, work heartily. This is, this is heart work, people. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And what Paul is saying is, is in these circles, whether it's your family or your workplace or your community or your congregation, as God sends you out to love, and you are called to work heartily with your whole heart, mind, body, and soul. Paul wants you to know that you are serving the Lord. You're not just doing it for the person. Here's what that looks like in a concrete example. Maybe your boss is a jerk. Maybe your boss is rude. Maybe they're unkind and unfair. And I'm up here telling you to serve your boss and to go to work and do a good job. And maybe you're thinking, Dan, you don't know my boss. He's the worst. He doesn't deserve it. I'm saying that's okay. And Paul is saying, when you love him, you're loving the Lord. You're showing your faith and devotion to God, our Father in heaven, as you love his children here on earth. So Martin Luther says this in the, in the large catechism. Sorry if I'm quoting Luther too much. I, I think he had a lot of good things to say. You maybe had a small catechism when, when you went through confirmation, but there's another little bit bigger one creatively called the Large Catechism. And it has a lot of good in it. This is one of my favorite quotes. He says, Is it not an excellent boast to know and say that if you perform your daily domestic task, this is better than all the sanctity 
and ascetic life of monks. What he's saying is, when you live out your simple calling, domestic task, when you live out your everyday vocation from God in your home and at work and in your community and in your congregation, as you're doing the smallest, most mundane, everyday, boring, easy ways to love, he says that is far more beautiful and far holier than some monk who ran away from the world to live in a cloister by himself, thinking he's serving God. See, in in Luther's day, the really holy people, the really religious people, they left their homes, they left their jobs, they left their communities, they left their congregations, and they went and hid by themselves. And they didn't love anyone. And they thought they were giving themselves to God by praying all day long. And they thought they were doing the best work, loving God with their whole heart by praying all day long, locked in their room by themselves. Not loving anyone. And Martin Luther is saying, how incredible. How incredible is it that the mom who's changing a poopy diaper is doing a far holier work than that man who ran away and has no one to love. I'm a pastor, and I love being a pastor. But being a pastor is no holier than being a garbage man. Playing music in a a Christian worship team is awesome, and you guys are awesome. But that's no holier than, than playing a trumpet in a marching band. Love your neighbor, your family, your work, your community, your congregation. And as you do, you are showing love to God. But here's what's what's uh, remarkable. Not only are you working for the Lord when you love your neighbor, but God is at work through you. God is at work through you. I met a a friend earlier today from Tehran, and he gets to speak um, Farsi and English and picking up some Danish And he learned English well, and I I asked him about being a translator and if that's something he wants to do with his career or profession. And he just said that God gave him this gift, and he wants to use it. And as he glorifies God with that gift from God, God is at work through him. You see, in your callings, whether at home or at work or in your community or in your congregation, it's not simply you loving your neighbor. It's not just you working heartily for the Lord and not for man, but God himself is at work through you. Whatever your calling, God works through you. You see, God loves this world that he created. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. God loves every man, woman, and child. And the way he gives his love is through you. There's a, a way that, that Luther in the Reformation described this working of God. And uh, I don't know if you can read that back there, but um, Luther said that we are masks, masks of God, like a mask you'd wear to a party, uh, like in Venice or something like that. Um, There's an organization in the States called the League of Faithful Masks. Sounds like superheroes, doesn't it? 
I think if, if that's not copyrighted, if I was going to plant a church today, instead of St. John Lutheran Church, I'd want to call it the League of Faithful Masks. Doesn't that sound cool? It feels like you should get a cape. That phrase when Martin Luther talked about God wearing masks, he means this. God is at work doing all kinds of incredible things, but sometimes he wears a drummer mask to help you keep the beat in the worship song. So you're not just drumming. It's actually God serving you. But he wears a mask that looks a lot like you. God is at work loving and serving people, but he wears masks. God is, God is hiding behind your callings as he loves his children. Does that, does that make sense? Are you with me? So, so when you are in your family and God wants to nurture an infant, he nurtures that infant as the mother nurses. God is providing life for that child, but he wears the mask of mother. And in your callings, as you work out in the world providing goods and services, God wants your neighbors to have those goods and services, and he wears a mask that looks a lot like you. So that it's not just you doing a good work. It's not just you striving. But God's love flows through you. God himself works through you. God wears masks. And in these different spheres, in your home and at work and in your community and in your congregation, think about this question. If God could do something to love these people, what would he do? How might you be that mask for God to use? The world might look out and say, wow, Soren's doing a great thing. But you and I and Soren, we know we're just poor beggars. God is doing a good thing in and through us. I have a, a, a quote. This is my last quote. I, I know that's a lot of words. But this summarizes what I'm trying to say about where God calls us to serve. It's a, an American author. His name's Gene Veith. He says this. Most people seek God in mystical experiences, spectacular miracles, and extraordinary acts they have to do. To find him in vocation, to find him in our callings, to find him wearing these masks, brings him literally down to earth makes us see how close he really is to us and transfigures everyday life. If we are able through the eyes of faith to recognize the way that God is at work through us and that God is loving through our neighbors, you will experience the love of God every day. If you're only looking for God to show up in big ways and part seas and, and heal broken bones, you might go years without seeing God. But if you can recognize where God promises to work, you will live every day in awe of him. We say in the Lord's Prayer, Give us this day our daily bread. Right? Making sure. I have prayed that prayer 20 times this week. I, I pray it at all four church services on a weekend. I pray it with my kids when I go to bed. I pray it with my wife when I go to sleep. 
I have prayed thousands of times throughout my life, give us this day our daily bread. Do you believe that God gives you your daily bread? Front row does. Uh, what about in, in the back or the middle? Do, do you believe that God gives you your daily bread? Okay. I, I do too. <laughs> Never once in my years of praying, give us this day our daily bread. Never once have I seen bread. <laughs> have you? Maybe. God hasn't done that for me. I believe he could. Let me be clear. I believe if God wanted to, he could make this pan au chocolat croissant stuffed with chocolate appear right there out of nothing. He could, just like the manna and the quail and the water from the rock, absolutely he could. But that's not how God normally works. I believe that God gives me my daily bread, same as he does for you. But that's not ordinarily how God works. How does God give me my daily bread? How does God give you your daily bread? He gives it to you through a farmer who sows wheat in the ground so that you can have daily bread. But in order for that farmer to sow the, the seeds in the ground, he has to buy the seed. And so God works through the farmer to grow the bread, but he has to work through the merchant to sell him the seed so that you can have daily bread. But the seed has to get to the warehouse, and the order has to get placed, and so the IT guys have to manage the internet and the cables and build the wiring and come up with the computer programming so that the farmer can place an order for the seed to go to the shop so that he can get the seed to sow the wheat so that you can have your daily bread. Before the farmer can place the order and drive for the seed, before the farmer can sow the seed in the ground, that farmer has to purchase the land. And to purchase the land, he has to get a loan. And before he can get a loan, he has to work with a bank. And the person at the bank who's going to approve the loan for the farmer to buy the land so he can order the seed so you can drive to the market, so you can sow the seed, so that you can have the daily bread. That banker who is going to approve the loan had to go to university. He had to study accounting. He had to learn what would be a good loan and a bad loan. And he went to school, and there were teachers. Those teachers might not have been Christian, but God worked through the teacher to train the banker to approve the loan for the farmer to buy the land so he could buy the seed from the market through the internet to plant the wheat so that you could have daily bread. If I had four more hours tonight, I could keep going. I could talk about all the ways that God had to work so that there would be roads that were paved, so that there would be tractors that would work the engineers who designed the plastic bags that the bread comes in, to the kid at the grocery store who puts the bread on the shelf, to the single mom at the checkout counter who receives your money and gives you the bread. Every one of these people is a mask of God whom God is using to love his children and provide daily bread. God is at work. And he could do it a different way. He could make bread appear miraculously. He could snap his fingers and change a baby's diaper. Sometimes I wish he would. But instead, God loves his children through moms and dads. 
God provides for our food and our education through people's jobs. God provides safe and fun and artistic communities through local government and national government. And God provides his life-giving word, Jesus, the bread of life. God provides that through congregations, not just the pastor and the organist, but he works through the old woman who smells funny, through the old man who doesn't sing very well. He brings joy through the children who, who cry and interrupt. He shares love for those children, for those elderly, through the young adults that sit and sing and show up and are an encouragement to the people of God. I don't know where God is sending you specifically, but I know he is sending you. He has shown you once again his perfect love this weekend in Jesus. And that love doesn't fade. That love is an undeserved gift. He delights to give it to you. And he wants the world to receive it. And he will give it to the world. And he invites you to be a part of it. No pressure. God's got it. We just get to be a mask. And God, who has begun a good work in you, will bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. To which I say, thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me? Gracious God above, thank you. Thank you for your gift of love in Jesus. Thank you for sharing your heart with us. God, thank you for the way you have worked in our hearts. And we pray, God, that we would get to work, encourage us and energize us to share your heart through our work. Lord, it is a daunting and big task to try and love everyone. Show us the people near us. Show us the people that you have entrusted to us. Show us big ways to love. But God, I pray, I pray, I pray. Show us the small ways. Show us the everyday ways. Help us take that simple first step. Whether it's a smile or a wave or trying to be to work on time. God, help us take that first step and reveal to us the next step after that. We commend ourselves, our lives, our friends, our family, and all that we have into your loving hands. And we pray thy will be done even through me. In Jesus' name, may it be so.